So good afternoon, everyone, and lovely to see such a full crowd for such a great event. Uh, my name is Michael Milde. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. And I would just like to start today, um, given events as they are unfolding in our country and in our province at the moment, to take uh, seriously our, uh, our commitment to reconciliation, which at the moment is looking to be receding rather than, than advancing. So I'd like to remind us that we are on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewa, and the Attawandran peoples, and that the land is subject to treaties uh, that bind us still, and that we need to respect uh, our history and work together to affect the promise of reconciliation. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick and uh, look at history in another way. Patrick. Thank you very much, Michael. <clears throat> so as you know, many of you, I'm Patrick Mann. I'm the director of the School for Advanced Studies in Arts and Humanities. And I'm really pleased to welcome such a great crowd to this, which is our second uh, speaker in our winter series, uh, which is dedicated or, or, or operates under our rubric, Evidence for the Future. And I think what Michael's talking about today really is about our future. It's a special honor to recognize our guest, Dr. Peter Meinick, who is a professor of classics uh, and the modern world at New York University, and I'll shortly be asking Dr. Eris Suksi to introduce him. But before I do that, I wanted to first uh, thank Era and acknowledge the tremendous work that she's doing teaching a course for us at SASA entitled The Iliad, Perfor Performing the Politics of Anger which is a platform that is bringing Dr. Meinick here to London. In the course, our second year SASA students engage in a close reading and discussion of the Iliad, one of our oldest surviving Greek texts, exploring what the poem has to say to us about our own experiences of anger, both in its capacity to drive positive change and also in its potential to cause injury, loss, and grief. Dr. Meinick is here in part to work with our students on their performance of selections from the Iliad, and they'll be doing a multimedia public performance combined with a panel of leaders from the mental health and social justice communities in London, and that will be presented at Museum London on March 19th in the evening. Sorry, 26th. Forget the 19th, stay home the 26th. And one final note, uh, following Dr. Meinick's talk, two of the students from the SASA second year class, Julia Albert and Andrew Fullerton, will lead off our question period. And so now I'll turn it over to Dr. Arasuksi. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Meinick, and it's going to take me a minute or two because there are so many things to be said. Uh, Professor Peter Meinick holds the endowed chair of Associate Professor of Classics in the Modern World at New York University. He's also Honorary Professor of Classics at the University of Nottingham and has held fellowships at Princeton, the Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies, the University of California, San Diego, and the Onassis Foundation. He specializes in ancient performance, cognitive theory, Greek literature and culture, and humanities public programming. Professor Meinick has published widely in the field of ancient performance. His most recent works include Theatrocracy, Greek Drama Cognition and the Imperative for Theater, Combat Trauma and the Ancient Greeks, edited with David Constan in 2014, and um, he's done many translations of ancient Greek uh, literature plays, um, but the most recent is a new translation of Sophocles' Philoctetes, um, uh, published with Hackett. In addition to his academic career, he has worked extensively in the professional theater in New York and London, founding the Aquila Theater in 1991. His national public programs, including Ancient Greeks' Modern Lives, the Warrior Chorus, and Shakespeare leaders in Har Harlem have earned a Chairman's Special Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities and numerous grants from the National Endowments for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Hayden, Anassas, and Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundations, among others. 
He's also directed and or produced over 50 productions of classical plays at venues as diverse as the Lincoln Center, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Carnegie Hall, the ancient stadium at Delphi, and the Bush and Obama White Houses. His productions of classical drama have toured extensively throughout North America and Europe. He also serves as a firefighter and emergency medical technician in New York and is currently the rescue captain with the Bedford Fire Department. <laughs> got, he's, okay, he's been promoted since my notes. <laughs> this, so this afternoon, we are so happy, I am so happy to be able to um, have him here to present his lecture, The Future of Ancient Greece, Activating the Classics Today for Tomorrow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Meinick. I got this. Thank you, Ara and Patrick. Um, thank you so much. I grew up in London, so it's nice to be home. Um, so, um, so today I'm going to talk to you uh, about all of that, really, I guess, um, and how I've combined it into public-facing programs where I've used the classics and humanities um, to really reach communities that I want to talk to and that I think that we should hear from. And the idea behind this and really the work I do is to encourage more of you to do that. Um, my, uh, my professorship has this grand title of Professor of Classics in the Modern World, but classics can only exist in the here and now and in the modern world. And so um, I was excited about this seminar series about thinking about the future and uh, bounding that off the past, and that really is what I try and do in my work, whether as a theatre director or a writer or, or now really with a lot of my public programming. So I'm concerned with this place, which is the Theatre of Dionysus in Athens, and um, I'm going to have to wander around to, to run this system. And I want to talk a little bit about um, Greek theatre and antiquity and how I think there was a very close relationship between the theatre, democracy, and the military. Um, and then I want to relate that to how I work with this material with the veteran population uh, and more and more now the refugee population um, internationally, but mainly in New York and some other places too. So let's see if this works. So let's start off with the Theatre of Dionysus in Athens because one of the things I have to do is um, deal with a lot of mythology about the classics and particularly about ancient drama, the nobility of ancient drama, the stateliness of ancient drama, right? All, all this is nonsense. Uh, ancient drama was powerful and emotional and intense and I think it performed a form of cultural therapy for a society that was completely traumatized by war. The fifth century, which is the period where what we call Greek drama, which is really Athenian drama, and as we know it, really the plays of three tragic playwrights, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. There's a reason for that I'll talk about later. They were all performed here, and in the fifth century, what's known as the classical period, the fifth century was really a time of almost constant war and occasionally peace broke out. Aeschylus' father, for example, would never have known this kind of intense combat, international war, wars with the Persians, the super empire to the east, wars amongst the Greeks. This is a society under siege, and yet it's producing these um, incredible works of art that have stayed with us. They have a resonance, and as the uh, VA psychologist um, Jonathan Shea, who wrote two seminal books, Achilles in Vietnam and Odysseus in America, said, Greek drama was written by combat veterans, performed by combat veterans for an audience of combat veterans because everybody in ancient Athens was involved in war. Male, female, enslaved people, foreigners, war, war was a constant. So that's something to bear in mind when we think about this material and something that I th think about a lot. A couple of little secrets I want to tell you about this site, because I hope you'll all go to Athens. It's a great city, and visit this site. It is one of the oldest theatres in the world, although it's not the oldest. Tomorrow, if you come to my talk tomorrow, I'm going to reveal to you where the oldest theatre in Greece is. It's not here. Um, and, it's also, uh, and also my, my theory that actually women invented tragedy, and they may have also invented democracy as well, but that's for tomorrow. That lecture's not ready for like, uh, everybody yet, so you, that, it's going to be a secret. Uh, preview. If you look at this remains that were excavated in the 1860s, um, we used to think that this was the great theatre of the classical period. The problem is what we realise now through new surveys of the site 
It's the only remains that we can sh be sure of from the theater of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes is uh, this little row of masonry here, SM1. Um, this block here that isn't even labeled. This little bit here, SM3. And this drain here, right? That's it. The rest is, is Hellenistic or Roman stuff. I'm not that interested in that particularly. Um, so what's great is if you go to the site, they stop you walking on the orchestra, right? No, oh, don't walk on the orchestra. Don't worry about it, that's Roman, right? <laughs> you, you, nothing wrong with the Romans, but their theater wasn't as good. You, you, you could go back and step across SM1 and, and you're, you're standing there on the performance space, right? Where these plays were originally produced. So what can we tell about this theater space? Well, first of all, uh, I grew up believing in the great democratic Greek theater, right? The theater of 30,000, or maybe the theater of 17,000. Plato talks about 30,000 people at the theater. He's probably described, he's exaggerating, or he's describing the festival itself, had a large procession. Um, 17,000 is a number we extrapolate from the much later theater Epidaurus. We now think that the theater sat around 5,000 people. So that's interesting because if there's about 60,000 voting male citizens, women didn't vote in 5th century Athens, is that really the democratic space that we all grew up on? Is that really, or is it an elite space? Which most theatre is, let's be honest, theatre is in most cultures an, a, an elite event. Um, however, actually I'll show you how we get to that. Um, 5,000 seats is still a large space, right? It's bigger than most Broadway theatres. But what we think that we have, instead of a stone circular theater, which we get in the fourth century, 100, 150 years later, we actually have an environmental space. Wooden seating, probably frontal, overlooking the sanctuary of Dionysus on the southeast slope of the, of the Acropolis. This is what I think the theater looked like at the time of Aeschylus in 458 BC. The Greeks didn't talk about going to the theater, they talked about going to see a chorus. And so when they went up onto the hillside, it was about being in that sacred environment, being in the open air, the incredible view that they saw. Theater means seeing place or viewing place. And also experiencing, as they watched these productions, upwards of 300 animals were being sacrificed in the sanctuary behind them. So those of you who know the Oresteia in the Agamemnon, when, when Cassandra goes to the doorway of the Skene, the scene building, and says that she can smell the blood, so can you, right? You, you can smell it too. So this is like a, a, a hyper cognitive event, right? A spectacle, it's a Roma theater, there's sights and sounds and festivals. This is very, very different to the experience of going to the theater today, where we put you in a black box and control you, right? We use lighting, we make you be quiet, you can't eat, we focus your attention on what I, the director, want you to see, right? And this is why theater can be the worst two hours of your life, right? It can make you really angry, or it can be a wonderful transformative experience but it's an opposite experience to what the audience were doing in the fifth century BC. Here's some uh, really uh, fascinating pictures, a uh, recent uh, discovery of post holes, which is our evidence for the fact that the seating was wooden. We actually have found the post holes with the wood grain on. Um, so they're sitting on wooden seats. This, this isn't the stone edifice that we've got used to thinking about the Greek theater. And there's no evidence for a circular orchestra either. These, these great stone theatres started to be built in the 4th century by the world's first classicists, a guy called Lycurgus, for example, in Athens, who wanted to enshrine the cultural capital of Athenian theatre by building a large architectural space. By that time, Greek theatre had changed, and that's not the theatre that I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the 5th century theatre. So what do we know about the theater that was performed in this quite minimal space, in this beautiful environment on the southeast slope of the Acropolis? Well, we have the plays, right? But the plays are not the scripts of the playwrights. We don't have any authorial scripts. We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And the earliest we can get back to with, with any sense of veracity is the second century, maybe the third century BC. So there's a couple hundred years missing, right? So these plays were probably composed by the playwright, um, almost certainly taught orally with call and response. Um, if they were written down, 
um, it was probably much later. So, and we don't have reviews, thank goodness, right? Who needs those, right? Um, we have, the references we do have to drama um, is scanty, and it comes mainly from Isocrates and Plato and Aristotle, but they all talk about how incredibly emotional Greek drama was, right? Now remember, it's probably an audience of predominantly, if not all men, right? And yet we have these amazing references. Now obviously, children fainted and women miscarried at the sight of the Furies is, is rubbish, right? <laughs> but it gets us to the point that this stuff was very, very emotional, right? The entire audience jumped to its feet in terror. Tragedy, famously, right, through pity and fear and other emotions, Aristotle says, accomplishes catharsis uh, to these and other emotions. So catharsis, that's a word I'm going to be returning to. Catharsis, that's what's going on in this space. Some more emotional reactions here if you want to look at them, right? So one of the words that we keep finding associated with the emotionality of Greek drama is psychokagos, right, which means something like the power to move the soul or to raise the dead. So this is what we're experiencing. Um, Plato complains about tragedy because he says, you know, men who don't shed a tear at the funeral of their own family members go to the theater and just bawl out in, in tears. And he thought that was unseemly. So clearly there's something happening here. This is what I'm interested in. So I'm not going to get too much into this, but I am a cognitive theorist. And that's a way that I think cognitive theory provides us with excellent tools to talk about the experience of performance. And classicists traditionally have been preoccupied with texts and maybe material culture, and recently we've become more interested in performance, and some of us are on the edge of that, thinking about the experience of performance, what's happening when we watch a show. And in the world of cognitive theory, those who are interested, I'm, I definitely believe in distributed cognition, and what that is is that thought, the mind, is not just this meat, right, between your head, it's, it's also you in the environment, your sensations, and there's a feedback loop between your mind and your body and the environment that you're in. This is very exciting for us historians and classicists because the moment that we accept that minds are part of their living environments, when we look at a Greek vase or, or a Roman remain in a glass case, instead of just looking at an ascetic object, we now have the remnant of an ancient thought. And I find that really exciting. And it's an exciting way to think about antiquity and performance, right? So this idea of extended cognition or four cognition is that your thought, your cognition is embodied in your, uh, and, and embedded in your own body. It's enacted, it's all about action, and it's extended out. So think about a piece of theater a piece of theatre um, is an excellent way to think about the cognition of the audience who watched it. Because a, th a piece of theatre to be successful has to do all those things. So it's a great way to think about the audience who are watching it. So that's what I use. Um, one example of that is when you're sitting in the theatre of Dionysus, and this is something that's always bothered me, is the biggest thing you see in the visual realm is not the stage, it's not the theatre, it's the sky. Right? And it's very hard, those of you who've done open air theatre, to compete with a view is very, very difficult. So, and, and here's a, a shot of Athens in the 1860s. The, th the theatre of Dionysus hasn't even been excavated yet. And you can see that the Acropolis, going up onto the Acropolis, is like going up and sitting in the sky. Right? It's a place of the gods. Okay, so what does that mean to be in the sky? So, very briefly, I haven't got time to go through all of this today, but looking at uh, work done by Fred Previck on fighter pilots in the US Navy and Marines who would get discombobulated when they lost the horizon and crash. And he was very interested in what happens when your visual realm goes out into this distal space, what happens to the body, right? And he actually completely reversed the way we think about space. He said, well, look, space is, is not something that happens to us. Space is something that we construct as we move through it, right? And here's his four realms of space. And the one that's really interesting is this green area, ambient extrapersonal space. And he found that those test pilots, when they got to the point where they were looking down at the instrument panel into uh, their peripersonal space, space you can touch, and they were looking out into ambient extrapersonal sky space, distal space, that's when they were crashing. But right before they crashed in the simulators, 
they all reported having out-of-body experiences. Now, these are Navy and Marine pilots. They're not particularly deeply spiritual people, right? They were saying, I, could, I, I, I feel very religious and spiritual right now, or I, I'm, I feel like I'm sitting on the end of my plane watching myself. They're literally describing ecstasy, ecstatis, to stand beside yourself. Dionysus, the god of the theater, is the god of ecstasy. And this is what I think theatre is trying to do to you in antiquity, is trying to make you stand beside yourself. It's trying to get you out of yourself and get you into another space. I think a more empathetic space. That makes for dangerous theatre. We don't like to stand outside ourselves. The other thing that happened with these pilots is so their brains got flushed with dopamine. We know dopamine as, as, as a reward neurotransmitter, but actually dopamine is, is connected with action. It's the thing that just makes you get out of the bed in the morning. It makes you desire or want anything, right? Um, and it's also connected with movement. So if you give eye dopa, which is fake dop uh, dopamine, to a rat, the rat will actually sniff twice as wide as it normally sniffs. If you give it to a monkey, they'll look and scan much further than they normally do. If you give eye dopa to a human, it increases their abstract thought. And one of the things that Previc found, which relates to the open air theater, here's, your, here's some dopamine being a neurotransmitter. One of the things he found is that when people look up, when they're deep in thought, we all do it, we all look up when we're deep in thought, actually produces dopamine. And the ventral pathway, um, we can actually make dopamine. Now, dopamine's great because it allows us to time travel, right? Through, through having dopamine, you can actually travel along your ventral pathway and recover a memory. A memory of a smell, oh, it sounds like prose now, a memory of a smell, a memory of a historical event. You can actually create a fiction through that. You think abstractly. That's what theater is. Theater is a place of abstract thought. We find all these Greeks looking up, right? Socrates is famous, right, for standing at the Battle of Potidae in the middle of the battlefield, just looking up for hours upon hours, you know, contemplating space. You can do this when you get home with your, with your roommates, right? Look them in the eye, which is weird. Don't do it for too long. And then say to them, what's your favorite food and when do you last have it? And when they go for the memory, they'll look up. Even though you're inside, they're getting that dopamine, right? So everybody looks up, right? Everybody looks up. Um, and this, this enacts the uh, your dopaminogenic pathways. When you're in the Greek theater, right, you're actually being encouraged all the time to look up and out at that sky space, right? So what you are, it's the opposite of the theater that you come to today, right? It's a theater that asks you to look away, asks you to contemplate, and is very gently altering your mind. You've probably had a couple of glasses of wine, right? Because it is the Festival of Dionysus very gently altering your mind into what I think is a place where you're ready to receive um, information narratives that perhaps you might have been less receptive to. So one can think of Plato's allegory of the cave, right? The great theoric traveler, where we get the word theory from, right? Is that the, the, the traveler in the cave, he's sitting in the cave, he's, he's watching flickering shadows, as we all do, right? I'm watching flickering shadows. And then he leaves the cave and he goes up to the light, and he goes up into the sky, and he beholds the forms. You all know this, right? And then he comes down, and he has to tell the rest of the people, still chained up, watching the flickering shadows, that everything they're watching is a lie. And Plato says, well, they may kill him, right? Because they don't want to hear that. I think that theoric traveler is the philosophical version of the playwright. The playwright is taking you on that journey, too. So how do you get that attention? How, how do you get those emotions? This is the mask. I haven't got massive amounts of time to talk about the mask today, but the mask is a very uncanny, uh, amazing attention grabber. So when I work with my class, I have this big class at NYU, like 100, and we, uh, we go out to Washington Square and we get one of the students, we say, stand under the square like that and see what happens. Guess what happens? Nothing. Then we put a mask on him or her and say, do it again. Then we all hide, and 99 of us hide. And, uh, and the tourists just suddenly stop and turn and form an audience, and they will stare at this masked student for like half an hour, who's not doing anything, right? Because the mask is a call to attention and a call to theatricality. The mask also stares at you, just as Dionysus stares at you, and in ancient Greece, to, to look is to touch, right? The idea of the, the evil eye, the Vascania. So being stared at by this mask that's often p performing taboo things can be quite disconcerting. And the mask is also inactive in that we see faces 
in everything, right? So this, people call this Jesus in a tortilla, right? I, I call it Barry Gibb from the Bee Gees in a tortilla, but you, you have you, your Jesus, I have mine, right? But, you know, we, our, our brains make faces whenever we see them. Masks are very inactive. And as I've argued elsewhere, the ancient Greek mask, very similar to the Japanese no mask, is capable of changing its expression, right? You can even see here in this static mask, completely different expression on the left to the right. That expression that you see is often dictated by culture as well. Different, different cultural groups will see different expressions, but they'll all see the expressions change. So I've argued that the mask is actually more emotional than the human face because it's the grief or the anger or the fear that you see on the mask, not what Brad Pitt does for you, right? So I'd love to see Brad Pitt in a mask. I would pay good money for that. The other thing that the mask does, it emphasizes movement. Right? So movement becomes really, really powerful, and a lot of the emotion is conveyed in movement, so we get this whole level of kinesthetic empathy. That's important because when I talk briefly about the reforms of Cleisthenes that kicked off the Athenian democracy, along with the reforms of the democracy and the military was that every tribe was going to send 50 boys and 50 men to dance in a Dionysia. That meant that every single Athenian citizen was a pretty good dancer. Right? So when I go and watch dance, my wife was the, uh, the prima ballerina at the Metropolitan Opera, right? And when I go watch dance with her, she's twi she twitches. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she has no idea she's doing it. Because she's actually dancing cognitively with the dancers, whereas I'm watching it totally aesthetically. She's having a different experience, right? It's, a, it's like if you've played a sport, you watch that sport. You, you feel it, you get it. So there's a whole level of, of uh, kinesthetic empathy here. And research has shown that when you take the face away, people perceive emotions much more acutely. You recognize people through their movements much more than you recognize them from their faces. So the mask does all this. So that idea of collective movement, kinesthetic empathy, you're in this open space, but you can create, you can create uh, emotionality and empathy, very much bodily empathy with the mask and with movement. And of course, music is the other element Greek plays were musicals. They were set to music. Even the so-called recitative of ancient Greek would have sounded like music. Um, we have no idea what ancient Greek music sounded like, right? But we hear how emotion it was, how dangerous it was, how there were lots of adventures in music. Um, I think the reason Athenian tragedy spread is because of the music. So we hear that the, the only survivors of the abortive great expedition against Sicily, the only people who got home out of the Sicilian mines were those who could remember the songs of Euripides. And the Sicilians loved Euripides and they would buy them out of, out of slavery and they would send them around this kind of underground railroad of, of dinner parties and they would eventually get enough money to come home. And you know, a late source tells us that they hugged Euripides when they got home because it was through his music they got back. I think what that source is telling us is that you know, music is the way that often culture gets transported. We don't have the music, but again, music is a big element. We hear how strange the music was, how Eastern it was, Anatolian. Uh, Aristotle and Plato rail against tragic music, and they say, you know, the music is, is actually doing terrible things to you, and you, know, you need to put parental guidance stickers on, on this music. It's the same thing, right? Um, I just did a translation of Aristophanes Frogs, and I just didn't like the way I translated the choruses, and I was trying to translate Euripides and understand what Euripides was all about, and I've, I've always thought that Euripides, you know, was a, would be a hip-hop artist today, right? And, and so I, I had to push my boundaries, and I kind of realized, um, with me, with, I, I never really got into hip-hop, I'm too old, I think, my kids are into it, but I've, I've come to realize that Wu-Tang Clan, they're poets, right? If you know the Wu-Tang Clan, they're poets. So I actually translated a, uh, I scanned an Aristophanes uh, song to, to a Wu-Tang Clan song, and uh, the reader's responses from that, the classicists who had to read the play and comment it were very interesting. And I thought, that's working now, right? They're, they're getting angry at music, right? So that's good. <laughs> so cognitive dissonance is, is part of this whole experience. You come to the theater, you get things you don't expect, you feel anxious and inconsistent, but through that, you start to make different and maybe even better decisions, right? I talked about the theater not being a democratic space, but it was pointed out to me, the democratic space in Athens, the Penix Hill, also only accommodated about 5,000 people. So it makes you think that in those terms, it's still the biggest 
public space that the Athenians built. So I guess we can still call it a democratic space. There's the Panix in the fifth century. So something happened, right, in Athens uh, at the, between the sort of uh, end of the sixth century, beginning of the fifth century, um, which is they kicked out their tyrants, the Spartans got involved with them, and then the Spartans came back and tried to sort of put in the, their, their pick in, in, and set up a new aristocratic regime. And the Athenians came from all over Attica as a big crowd and surrounded the Acropolis. You can still do that today, right, if you want to. And uh, there was this huge kind of movement of people, right, like a mass riot to defend their new, like, seeds of their democratic institution they developed after overthrowing their tyranny. Aeschylus was involved in this, right? He would have been maybe 20 years old at the time and saw his society rapidly change. What was amazing, within 18 months, they go from a kind of mob surrounding the Acropolis to a highly organized hoplite military force deploying about six to 7,000 men, which is a huge army in ancient terms, and, and faced off against a massive Peloponnesian force at Eleusis in around 508 BCE. And of course, in 490, they march 9,000 of these guys out to face the Persians. And because they're such great dancers, right, they're really maneuverable, right? They're able to like, do this famous trick and um, strategically defeat a much more superior Persian force. Of course, Aeschylus fights at the Battle of Marathon. On his gravestone, it was supposed to say, here lies Aeschylus, he fought the Battle of Marathon. The long-haired Mede can tell you what a great warrior he was, right? So he is the sort of archetypal warrior poet, and he was say, said to have lost a brother there as well. So what happened, right? Um, th there was this revolution, and so quickly we had these reforms of Cleisthenes, where we get the word democracy from, right? The deems are organized into these three regional groups that each contribute. The city, the hills, the coast, they all hated each other, right? They brought them together under 10 tribes. These 10 tribes sent their representatives to the assembly, the Bouli, and also recruited for the choruses and the Dionysia and for the military. So the seeds of democracy are tied into this relationship between the theater and the military. And that's something that I've definitely exploited in my own programming. Right? You even see that in rep representations of, of tragedy. And of course, as you know, Athens enfranchises even more because it needs rowers for the fleet, right? So now the working class, my people, now they've also got the vote, right? So you have this massive kind of new radical democracy that emerges fully formed probably around 460. So how does this stuff speak to this audience and how, does, how can we make that speak to an audience today? Well, you know a lot of these plays deal directly with warriors and warfare, but never about war. Always about homecoming, um, about the effects of war, and war is um, something that's often unorganized. Here's Philoctetes, right, the archetypal wounded warrior, abandoned on an island for 10 years until they need him again. Every vet I've worked with actually identifies with this play, right? The idea that the state uses you, you get injured, and then you're abandoned. Or Ajax, right? And his famous suicide when, when he's fought for 10 years and with the, uh, with the Greeks against the Trojans, he's denied the armor of his cousin Achilles. He snaps and he tries to kill um, the other Greeks. And when he fails, he actually uh, commits suicide. And, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know, the... the it's a two to one ratio of uh, deaths of veterans compared to civilians. And that's just what's reported in America by the VA. There's lots of suicides that aren't counted. Car crashes, you know, uh, slow deaths by drugs and alcohol, right? So suicide is a big thing, not just with first responders, with a lot of sufferers of trauma. And of course, the greatest Greek warrior of all, Hercules, Heracles, right? Heracles is denied a family and a homecoming. Whenever he comes home from a mission, Hera sends him insane, and he kills his own family, right? It's terrifying. And uh, I actually think Greek tragedy has more of a sophisti sophisticated way of thinking about mental illness than we do, because we tend to still think of mental illness as some kind of personal failure or stigma, which is crazy, right? Because this is the disease. The Greeks said, no, no, it's sent on you by the gods. It's not your fault, which to me is a very sophisticated way of thinking about it. Most modern audiences can't understand why Heracles' comrade-in-arms, Theseus, um, 
lifts the veil from Heracles after he's committed this horrible act, looks him in the eye and says, my love for you is stronger than any way that you can curse me. Come and live with me in Athens. Um, that's a show I've done with veterans as well. Sophocles, who served as a strategoi, a general, um, during the Peloponnesian War, he brought in the cult of Asclepius, the healing god, and he set that shrine up next to the Theatre of Dionysus, there it is, in Athens, giving us a physical uh, incarnation of this relationship between the theatre and healing. But what kind of healing, right? It's not a physical healing, it's a cathartic healing, it's a cognitive healing. It's encapsulated in this moment in Homer's Odyssey, um, where Demodocus the Bard comes into the court of King Alcinius, and this is Flaxman's uh, famous drawing, and, and Odysseus is in disguise, right? And the bard starts singing songs of the Trojan War. Um, and Odysseus weeps. And it's interesting, because he doesn't just weep. Uh, Homer says he weeps like a Trojan woman uh, lamenting, wailing over her dead husband, and then she's forced into slavery at the, at, at the butt of a Greek spear. Now, when I've worked on this simile with veterans, they all, they're all flawed by that. They say, wow, Homer knows war. That's war. Right? Odysseus is not, yeah, I invented the Trojan horse. Yes, I won the war. Yes, this is glorious. He's weeping about, about the cost of war on civilians. That's the reality of this stuff. And I think that's why it strikes such a chord with veterans today. So a little bit about me, right? Uh, point if you can find me there. I was a Royal Marine. I joined when I was 17. And I, I signed on for 22 years. And I thought, I'm going to be a Royal Marine forever. I didn't even know how much money I got paid back then. I was crazy. And um, my life went in a different direction. Um, and I never served in combat. But I've always been interested in the veteran population. Um, and They've always been very kind to me. I also serve as a firefighter now, which brings me into contact with a lot of people who aren't in academia, which we should all do, right? Uh, that, that's important. A lot of veterans, a lot of law enforcement people. Um, there's a very high rate of uh, PTS also in first responders as well. So how have I put this into practice? Well, initially with a program called Ancient Greeks, Modern Lives, where we were asked by the National Endowment for the Humanities, long may they continue. Trump has just struck them out of his budget, but somehow they're surviving. I asked my friends at the National Endowment for the Humanities, what happens when the White House comes? They say, we turn off the lights, we lie on the floor, we pretend we're not here. <laughs> so this is like the, 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 the NEH and the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. I mean, I'm talking to Canadians, right? You have to understand how valuable this is in America, right? I've lived in America now, an American citizen for 26 years, and to have something that takes your taxes, and redistributes it through a blind process and isn't just me going to a rich person and asking them for money. Please, Mr. 1%, can you fund me, right? If you're like a Puerto Rican kid in the Bronx and you're doing work that attacks the banks, do you think you could get any money? Do you think you're, you know, the, the foundations are going to fund you? No, right? So the NEH is one of those few places that you can go that can, you know, can actually still fund some interesting projects. So we were asked to put together a project um, based around the Iliad. And I was talking about this this afternoon. We'd done a production of book one of Homer's Iliad, which kind of had a World War II feel. And we decided to tour this production around public libraries. This is the magnificent, bad slide, Brooklyn Public Library. Libraries, uh, this was about 12 years ago. Libraries in America were struggling, right, because the internet came in. So what's a library now? Just a repository for books. So the NEH wanted libraries to become places for public programming. Now, here's the thing about the American Public Library. Think about it. It's one of the few places where you can have a non-commercial relationship. You don't have to spend any money. Right? That's a beautiful thing, right? So I got to know American libraries and, and librarians. And I also like the idea of shouting in a library by doing a show there. Right? That appealed to me. But we, we did this project. We took it to 100 underserved libraries all over America, so rural communities, inner city communities. And we started off performing the Iliad, and then we realized that people would then want to talk about aesthetics. So we started to do stage readings, right? Just read scenes from Greek drama, um, create dialogue around it, and create a conversation about what the Greeks um, mean to us today. And we started to do a lot of military bases, a lot of different libraries in Kansas. Really interesting people came out to these things. 
But lots of vets came, particularly Vietnam vets and Korean War vets and some World War II vets. They wanted to talk about this stuff. America was at war, as you, you were too, in Afghanistan and Iraq. That was bubbling up. Suddenly there was a dialogue. And a lot of our vets said it'd be great to have a program that's not just for vets, but puts vets in dialogue with the public. And the great thing about humanities material is it's complex, right? It allows for deep discussion and it kind of lifts the conversation whenever people start to get kind of mired in their own positions, right? You can go, well, let's look at what Homer says, or, or what about Sophocles, right? And it, it just sort of takes it to this different place. So we started to find that this material was a really great way to get people from different backgrounds to talk to each other. So the, the next program we did, we, this was a three-year program going to 100 sites. We then did You Stories, which we developed an app where um, it was the first app of its kind where you could upload video. I didn't develop it, these app guys did, but I asked them to do it and um, help with the content. And um, they, uh, vets could engage with this material online and upload their own stories. And all those stories went to the Library of Congress. Amazing stories, right? S chilling stories. Sto some stories we were like, no, we can't actually put that out there because it's really close to the bone. But uh, the veteran community, particularly those coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, they had things to say and they wanted to say it. And one of our veterans said, I like this program because in a democracy that vote for war, Americans need to become more literate about war and the cost of war. And war doesn't stop when the war's over. Well, these wars aren't over, you know that, right? There's a cost to it. So he felt it was really important to sort of use this material to put out this idea. So here you can see some of the vets that participated in it. And you can see we built it around themes and different plays. And it was amazing, right, just hearing from these veterans from all, all different walks of life talking to us, right, the wisdom that they had inherited on the battlefield. There's the classicist and philosopher Paul Woodruff at University of Texas, who's a Vietnam veteran, who talked about the most amazing story about his survivor's guilt of sending two men into a forward position who were killed and never forgiving himself for, for his whole life, and how angry he gets as a dean when he experiences a lazy professor, right? Because he's like, you know, the, the, the joy of being able to teach. And, you know, Paul, Paul actually built, handcrafted his own, like, great big dean's, like, round table, where everybody comes and talks out their problems at UT. But his experience as a warrior shaped his life, right? And we tend to think of warriors and, and veterans as a certain type of people. And one of the things we realize in their program is they're you and me. They're everybody, right? Every gender, every background, every ethnicity. So through doing this program, we got to talk a bit of truth to power, right? As well as going grassroots, we got invited into sort of uh, the White House, right? So we've been to the White House twice, once to the Bush White House, once to the Obama White House. I have to say, I won't go to this White House, right? So that's just, I just won't, right? But um, we got to start to work directly with veterans. I felt that a lot of veteran programming was taking money and kind of talking down to veterans. So I started to train the vets to run their own programming. And so here's the vets at the White House doing their own readings, vets from different wars. Um, on the front row there is basically the Pentagon top brass, including General Petraeus at the time. So some of them could speak directly through these texts to, to, the, to their generals. This is uh, A.J. Pichardo, who was court-martialed at Abu Ghraib because he refused to participate in what went on there. And uh, we found him at the Tisch School uh, learning drama, and he had a lot to say, and it was great to work with him. And Johnny here, who did four tours of Afghanistan and three tours of Iraq, who was a ranger, a commando, and uh, he's doing the suicide speech for Asia, and he's, he's got Petraeus like, locked in his gaze right now. He's very, very powerful. And uh, this is a uh, final scene from the Odyssey. Uh, that we did from book 23, the reunification of Odysseus and um, Penelope. And uh, Brian, who was a door gunner in Vietnam, he talked about when he got home from the Vietnam War, he took his uniform off at the airport, he threw it in the trash, he was in disguise. And he said, I felt like I was drowning. And, and my wife at the time, my girlfriend who became my wife, was the only person who extended her hand. He said, because I'd killed so many people, I just didn't think that I could exist in the world. And when he hit that simile of the drowning man in book 23 of, of the Odyssey, it was, like an, it was amazing for him, performing it here. 
And a big part of it was talkbacks, right? This gentleman here, he sadly passed away now, the Commodore, World War II veteran, he stood up and told us the most amazing stories of being in um, an African-American unit in World War II and experienced not only the enemy, but also the enemy of racism within the US Army. And there he was at the White House talking about this stuff, this great wisdom. So creating this kind of dialogue was wonderful. We took the veterans to Athens, performing Euripides Heracles. Um, there is Brian, one of our Vietnam vets, wearing the mask of Heracles, performing with my daughter. I've told this joke before, but it's worth telling again. That's my daughter, Sophia. She was seven at the time, playing one of the children of Heracles, who was killed by Heracles. I originally had both my kids in the show, but the five-year-old was just making everybody laugh, so she got fired. <laughs> but when, when Sophia went back to school, the teacher said, what are you doing in the summer, girls? And Sophia said, oh, I was in a play. And the teacher said, what was the play? Heracles. Oh, I don't know that play. What happens? My daddy kills me. I got a phone call from the school. <laughs> Dad's a classics professor, right? But Brian, Brian, this, this was one of the hard things about this program. I'm not a therapist, right? And sometimes it got close to the bone. And Brian, Brian wants me to tell this story. Um, when he was performing Heracles, a man who kills his own children, he suddenly stopped in rehearsal and he said, I could hear the children crying. And we thought he was acting. He goes, no, I can hear the children crying. I thought I was over this. He said, he was a door gunner he would fire at figures on tree lines and then they would send another unit in to do the body count and somebody made a mistake and they sent his unit back in to the battle they'd just been in and they landed and he realized that he'd killed a lot of children and he said as I was putting their little bodies into the body bags I could hear them crying and he said I'm hearing it now I don't know how to deal with that right except just hug the guy and just be there for him right and Brian will carry that his whole life right but he's dedicated himself to being an actor and a and, and, and devoting himself to the arts, right? But then what happened is he said, um, he, he came in, he told us that he was really angry at the officer who had ordered them back. And that night uh, in Vietnam, he went to, wanted to kill him. And, and he, couldn't, he couldn't touch his weapon anymore. It was too hot to him. It felt hot to touch. He was going to kill him with a knife. And he said the rest of the guys held him down in the hooch and got him drunk, and next morning he was over it. So he told us his story, which was amazing. And the next day he came in, he said, you know, I, I telephoned that officer last night. We're like, what? Yeah, I've never spoken to him. I looked him up uh, on, on, the, on the sort of unit page. And I, I called this officer, and I told him I was going to kill him in Vietnam. We're like, Brian, what the heck? And he said, no, I had a whole conversation with him. And I, I saw it from his perspective. And I realized that he was you know, also just dealing with this horrible situation. So it was kind of amazing. I, maybe being in the show helped him. I don't know. but. You know, sometimes the stuff that's in these plays is as monumental as what people who've experienced combat and war and any kind of trauma, whether it's sexual assault or being a first responder, um, also face. But that's what's powerful about these plays, right, is it deals with this stuff straight on. Um, we performed the play at BAM, and we went around the country filming veterans speaking about their experiences, and that was very powerful too, integrating film. And then we did a version of the program aimed at women veterans called, where we took Sophocles Philoctetes and recast it with a woman, calling it female Philoctetes. We wanted to hear um, women have always been in war, uh, but it was uh, illegal for women to be in combat uh, in the United States until about six years ago. So you had a lot of women who were in combat, right, uh, who then would not get any benefits or not be recognized as being combat veterans. Plus, there's an enormous amount of sexual assault in the military, both women and men. Um, massive amounts of sexism, as you can imagine. Um, they had a lot to talk about. So we were able to work with this, this fantastic community on this project. And the chorus in that project were veterans. And the director, Desiree Sanchez, uh, used the sort of military movements of the veterans to put them on stage. And you can see there's like a power, right, to these guys who've been to war. And, and that gave us the inspiration um, to think about choruses. We, we took that group to Athens again, and we worked with a refugee charity there called Station Athens. And this was remarkable, right? These are guys who'd, who'd been in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria. It was naughty, but they were there. And we did workshops with the American veterans with basically men uh, it's segregated, obviously, because it's an Islamic community, with men who came from Afghanistan and Iran, Iraq, and Syria. So these are, these are people who, the last time they saw this population, they were kicking in their doors and, and searching their houses and screaming. Now they're, they're doing 
um, workshops together, nonverbal workshops based on Greek drama. So, so here's one of our Marines, a Marine captain who, who's a big rest, Texan wrestling champion, and he started to do a workshop with this Afghan guy, and they started to wrestle, and it started to get a little bit close to the bone. We thought, should we stop this? And what, what happened is Caleb, the Marine, got this guy in a hold, but this Afghan would not, he would not give up. It was like a metaphor, right? And eventually the two men just burst into tears. It was very, very powerful. And they kind of ran, ran off into the wings. And then they came back and they kind of hugged each other, right? And you know, something happened. And we thought, well, there's another, there's another layer to this, right? Of bringing the, of, of kind of re-energizing these veterans, giving them another mission, taking that experience and turning it into something positive, right? And seeing, seeing these men uh, together, and then eating together and, and dining together. Uh, Athens being at the front line of the European refugee crisis was powerful. Uh, we turned this into our current program. I'm nearly done, the Warrior Chorus. And uh, we again returned to Philoctetes with an all-veteran production. Every actor in it was a veteran. This is the great Richard Chavez. Um, if any of you have ever seen that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Predator, you know that movie? It's kind of a cult film. Richard is in that movie, right? So see if you can spot him. Richard. Um, was a drama student, like some of you guys, and was drafted out of nowhere and went into the Marines and was very angry about it and came back and resumed his, his career and actually was a very successful movie and TV actor until the PTS set in, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. This was the first time he'd been back in an acting role since. And uh, he was playing Philoctetes. Richard is Philoctetes. I mean, it was an honor to work with him, very powerful, lovely guy. Community, right? That's the big thing. You know this. That's one of the big things that theatre offers. You know, everyone's together. When, when I left the Marines and I went to University College London and uh, I got involved in the theatre as a technician, another former Marine was, was working there, um, I had never seen all these weird and wonderful people before. I mean, I grew up in, in working class South London. I joined the Marines. I'd never met revolutionary communists. I'd never met lesbians. I'd never met gay people, right? There they all were in the theater, right? And you know what I realized? They're commandos too, right? You don't have to be blowing stuff up and killing people to be a commando. You could be an artistic commando. Everybody is working together to make that show go up at 8 o'clock. So that sense of community, something that's kind of often lacking in modern society, the theater can give. And that's a big part of the program, I think. We also helped the NEH create this new program called Dialogues on the Experience of War, which is now 100 different programs all over America. It's great to see that. And we have a warrior chorus section now in New York that works on theatre. In Los Angeles, they make movies. This is the LA group. Uh, we have a new one now. This is not it. We have a new one now in Miami, which is mainly African-American Vietnam vets who are fantastic. And we've also used our veterans in teaching on our Harlem Shakespeare and Greek drama program. This is an after-school program in Frederick Douglass Academy in Harlem. Kids who are failing English can pass English if they do a Shakespeare or a Greek play, right? So these are kids who really don't want to be actors, who don't want to be in the theater. And I love this program, and they do fantastic work. This is them in the Iliad. And we've also got involved in vets organizations that help train veterans to get into politics. And so here's Desiree Sanchez, our director, working with vets on, you know, how to present themselves and how to kind of move their bodies and how to speak to people. And um, so there's a great sense of activism in what we're doing because we think that veterans in Congress is a really, really good idea. The vets have deployed in support of the National Endowment of Humanities. So the NEH often send us to Washington, D.C., because, you know, it's pretty hard if you're a Republican senator to argue against a couple of Navy SEALs who are like, Greek drama's really good, right? It's like, a, it's persuasive. Suddenly in America, it feels subversive reading scenes from Greek tragedy about democracy in, in the open air. It's like, what has happened to, to our country? Got to take it back. These men and women will help us. And encouraging veterans to create their own work and perform it. They did in this play called Our Trojan War, which they completely made themselves. Very powerful show at Book and Academy of Music. We went to the US Capitol. Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who's uh, a wonderful guy, uh, he brought us in um, to present uh, some of our work to uh, 300 congressmen and senators. He could have made it about himself, 
but he used it to present three groups supported by the National Endowment for Humanities. One of them was a wonderful um, indigenous um, group from Kansas, and I, I shared the car with one of their drummers, who was also a colonel in the National Guard. And I said, what's your classics? He said, listen, and he beat it for me on his drum, and he started to sing it, right? And we had a really good conversation about classics, because it's not just Greek and Latin classics that we're interested in. So we were all performing classics that night. But again, having Navy SEALs, right, speaking this material uh, to these senators, I think it has an impact, right? I mean, the city is not ruled by one man, but it's free. The people rule in succession year by year, allowing no preference work to go on, right? We hope. This stuff's important. Producing their own work, amazing stuff. Performing at temples of culture, getting out into the community. I think the second quote is interesting. Tragedies reveal the horrible consequence of seeing things in black and white. So encourage us to discern shades of gray. And that's what I'm fighting for, right? We're in, we're in a culture now where people are on the right or the left and they're screaming at each other, right? But what about the middle, right? Where's that gone? What about dialogue? What about complexity? That's what Greek tragedy is all about. And just recently, we had the veterans, sorry about the quality of slides, teach a new program to uh, refugee, children of refugee in New York, working on uh, the suppliant women. And uh, I got to teach on that. And that was amazing to work with 20 of these kids. And we were working on this play, uh, The Suppliant Women. We took them to the Met Museum. And um, sorry about the quality of these. And one of the kids, after four days, we're doing this play. Suppliant Women is a play about a group of African women who flee Egypt and come to Greece, saying that you know we're, we're related, we're, we're descended from Io, and we're fleeing our husbands. We don't want to be in these forced marriages. You need to take us in. And uh, one of the refugee kids said, that's my story, right? Because she, she was from um, a country that still have arranged marriages, and her mother wasn't, and she was going to get married off at the age of 13. And that night, they packed a bag and fled. So just when you think these stories are ancient, right, these kids, these vets, they've taught me so much about what these plays mean and the power of them. And um, of course, Suppliant Women, which I'll end on, is an amazing play because it's the earliest use of the word democracy, right? There it is, yeah? Democratusa, right? Well, uh, they're asking, what did the power of the people's hands decide, right? Uh, there's your African women refugees, right? Still going on. This stuff's really key when democracy is under threat and is so fragile. One thing we've all learned in Trump's America is how fragile democracy is. So in a way, we're trying to kind of use this program and use our veterans to get out there and advocate for it and create a conversation on it. Um, and really use something that's very ancient and quite misunderstood in a way to think about what our future is going to be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Julia and uh, Andrew, and they're going to start with a couple of questions, okay. and then we'll open it up. Uh, thank you so much. I and I think up, really. my question, you've touched on a lot of what it addresses, but in Hannah Arendt's 1967 essay, Truth in Politics, she discusses the notion of Homeric impartiality, meaning Homer's disinterested pursuit of truth who's saying, she says, the deeds of the Trojans no less than of the Achaeans. And Arendt considers the political function of poets, like Homer, to be catharsis for the audience. In other words, she says, a cleansing or purging of all emotions that could pre prevent men from acting. So in many of the humanities projects you have created, including Warrior Chorus and Hear Our Call, you work with individuals who have lived through scarring experiences, refugees, veterans, in war-torn countries. So do you find that catharsis must be experienced by the performer, uh, particularly those in these programs, before it can be experienced by the audience members? Well, what an interesting question. So catharsis, right, um, first of all, if I may, I, t I talk about my own cathartic epiphany, which was, you know, I'm a first responder, right? And uh, I, I, was, I was not on duty, but a call came in uh, for these kids who'd been stabbed. So I was like, I gotta go. So I went out and I, and I jumped in the ambulance and I got to this house and 
I'm the first on scene, me and my driver, and I'm a pretty new EMT at the time. Well, I've been a medic in the, in the Marines, different. And there's a cop there and a woman holding two bloody knives, like just standing there, and the cop's just completely... And I go in and there's two kids on the ground and they're bleeding profusely in the kitchen. And I feel like I stood there for an hour doing nothing, right? And everything was like gray. And I have no memory of stopping any bleeding, packaging the kids. And the next thing I remember is a seven-year-old kid asking me if they're going to die and then telling me there's something evil in the kitchen. And what happened is their aunt had stopped taking her medications and had decided to stab these kids who she was babysitting. They both had like 40 stab wounds. They didn't die, right? Uh, they survived, but I thought about that family, right? I thought about the grandmother who came and had to deal with the fact that her, one of her daughters tried to kill her grandchildren and mental illness and, and what these kids have to deal with. And, and you know, and the next day I went to a conference at the Getty Museum and I was put on my little professor jacket and I kind of tried to put it out of my mind, but it kept kind of searing into my mind and I kept stopping and feeling useless and pathetic and like, why did you stand there for so long and what's wrong with you? And, you know, and then I remembered Euripides Heracles, right? Uh, I thought, wow, there's a Euripides play about this. And I reread it and I went, oh, I get this play now. The feeling I had at that doorway, of course I didn't stand there for an hour, it's a standard thing, time slows down, but I felt like someone had ripped a hole in the universe because you're not supposed to see kids flapping around like, like fish, bleeding everywhere, it's just, you can't take it in, right? So <coughs> I was like, yeah, I, I think I've been traumatized by this and by reading that play, it made me feel better and I tell you this story, it makes me feel better, right? So, and I think all first responders do this to a certain extent, often with each other. So I worked on that play for that reason. And I think that's catharsis. It's not that it's going to like cure you or it's not, it's going it, it's going to contextualize that and say other people have suffered this too and you can continue on. And that, that whole cognitive dissonance thing, yeah, you think life is like this, but every now and again it's not. And maybe that's okay, right? So a lot of first responders, like we see a lot of carnage, but you know, you appreciate life. You, you know, you see the opposite of it. So I think the Greeks are doing a similar thing. They're dealing with carnage, they're dealing with war, they're dealing with famine and plague, right? So they're trying to contextualize that and create a community of people who are allowed to feel something. So you're not alone in what you're feeling. And you know, in, <clears throat> in first response world, they, have, they sit us down at the firehouse and they bring in these FDNY fire chiefs. And they go, you've got to have therapy. I had therapy after 9-11, you've got to have therapy. And everybody tells their story, the first cop on scene to the last surgeon. Everybody tells it, and everybody feels like they messed up. And then everyone, and then everyone starts talking to each other, and it's like a weight is lifted off you, right? Because we all feel that way. We all feel like we're failing. So I think catharsis is, is that simple. So sitting in that open-air theater and all experiencing that is kind of a big deal. Yeah, I do think Hannah Arendt is right. Homer does that, right? So that's what I think it is. Um, I don't think it's an, a, a purgation per se. Yes, you can feel better by crying. You, know, you release prolactin, right, which does make you feel better. I think it's more a sense that by sh sharing your story or feeling like somebody else is sharing your story, you, you don't feel alone, if that answers your question. Make uh, yours well, easier, please. That? Make your question easier. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess my question is more about process. Okay, so when good. you're doing projects like the Warrior Chorus and things that are very collaborative, people from different groups, um, is intellectual collaboration something that tends to come later in the process organically as vets, academics, artists, even students and refugees come to better understand each other's ideas and perspectives? Hmm. Or are there certain things you do to try and foster a shared intellectual space right off the bat? Yeah, that's a really good question because with the vets, often they're working, inspired by the Greek material, they're, they're working on their own creative works, right? And that's okay. Sometimes the discussions, right, can get heated because there's different experiences, right? There's no one veteran experience. Different services have different prejudices against each other, right? There's different officers have, you know, we, we, we have colonels down to, you know, privates, right? And people have different perspectives. I think when it does get heated like that, you can go, well, look at one of the Iliad and look at what happens with Agamemnon and, and Achilles. And you could kind of use that and you can use the material to diffuse it. Well, diffuse is the wrong word, to channel it into something productive, 
So I, I think, again, the Greeks had a word for conflict, right, agon, and it wasn't always negative, right? Out, out of conflict could come creativity. Uh, I think it's just about managing the conflict so it never becomes that someone's getting bullied or someone's voice is getting tamped down. Um, so I think we try, for we, we, we try for that and we try to sort of create that environment. As I say, I think the material helps with that. There's something about taking that step to have to think about something that's not you and what you're feeling in that moment, that can really help. I'm, I'm developing a program now for police officers and, and firefighters because I, I don't know how it is here, but in, in, in America, the, p the police are becoming more and more divorced from civilians and they're losing empathy. And there's a lot of sections of the population who they really don't know anything about and this leads to violence. And I feel like we have to start speaking to them and getting them around tables and stuff. So how do you do that, right? How, how do you get police officers reading Homer, right? The vet, maybe the vets. Maybe if I say, hey, a couple of Navy SEALs are coming to your police station and they're going to come talk to you about their war experiences and you're going to read Homer. Maybe they'll show up for that, right? And then they can start having that conversation. I just think we've got to talk to each other and create that dialogue. So uh, I think each, each situation is different. Um, there's some training involved in your facilitators, right? There's some people who probably shouldn't be doing it and other people who are more generous. Um, some, some, some scholars who get involved in the project, there's a learning curve for them as well because they have judgments about the people that they're working with or they're a little, they, they have some fear. Um, with Ancient Greeks and Modern Lives, we hired 60 classics professors, right? And one, one, one of them said, we had a big learning session and one of them said, you know, I, I, uh, I was opposed to the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, so I'm sorry that you suffered there, but you, know, you did volunteer to go. And one of our female vets said, I volunteered to go the first time. And then they kept calling me back. And then she said, did you protest every day I served? And I thought that totally put it into context, right? So that was a good dialogue, right? That people are sort of talking to each other that came out of maybe a little, a little bit of conflict. Hope that answers your question. Great. <clears throat> we can open it up if there are any other questions. Jill? Thank you. Um, so I'm very involved in the spoken word poetry scene here in London, and we see a lot of what we refer to as trauma poetry. Um, a lot of spoken word poetry, people think it has to talk about dark subjects, and for some people that can be healthy to work through that stuff. Like you said, it can have catharsis yeah. in processing, but some people don't process it in a healthy way and Correct. they're just kind of re-traumatizing yourself. Yes. So how do you make that distinction in the theater and how do you yeah. make sure you're keeping people safe? Yes, great question. So vets call this trauma porn, right? And there are programs that peddle trauma porn. Um, I'm not gonna name one, but there's one big national program that's very well funded because, you know, when you're going to a foundation, you say Greek drama, uh, cures veteran PTSD. Oh, great. Because there's great guilt, right, in American society about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's this idea of moral injury, right? Of course these vets are morally injured. Well, first of all, as you know, there's massive shades of trauma. Not everybody who serves suffers trauma. Um, not everybody wants to talk about it or is ready to talk about it. So our program's not about trauma, right? It's about, um, I'm a professor and you're a veteran. These are plays written by combat veterans for combat veterans, right? So. Let's learn off each other, right? And I have learned, I've changed my mind about so much in these plays. So we try and equal, it's a dialogue, right? That's what we as professors do, we do dialogue. <coughs> Trauma comes up if it comes up, right? And I say, times like with Brian, you go, wow, this is, we, we're really not equipped to deal with this, right? Uh, luckily, Brian was and had someone to speak to. We've, we've learned to have referrals now, right? When that comes up. So. Um, but yeah, this idea that like every veteran's got PTSD, well, how's that gonna help vets get jobs, right? So what helps, vet, what we do is give vets jobs. We pay them, right, to be artists, to create. We pay them for their work. We put them in a professional environment. That's what we can do. Um, a lot of what they wanna speak about isn't about trauma. And in fact, I think since 2016, a lot of people in our programs have wanted to be less self-reflexive and more about what's going on in America. And in a way, I'd say the program has now turned into something that's about, we fought for democracy, right? Maybe we were misled sometimes in that fight, but we want to keep fighting for it. So there's, there's kind of a redeployment of those vets right now. But I'm really glad you brought that up because we must all not tolerate trauma porn. And you know it when you see it, right? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, 
Randall. <clears throat> uh, thanks very much. Your, your work approaches the, the Greek text that you're using in a very uh, sort of uh, in a very uh, embodied and communal way. My own experience of classics is a lot more solitary and relies on a more painstaking kind of philology. I know, but I've been in your office. That's also work that you do. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I wonder if you can comment on the place of philology in, in your work in this project. Well, it's essential, right? Because um, you, you cannot understand these plays without philologists. I train as a philologist, right? And um, at the end of the day, we have material culture and we have the texts. And even though those of your actors know the two favorite words you hear in rehearsal are off book, right? Which a classicist never wants to be off book, right? But actors all want to be off book, right? I've learned the lines, I've put the script down, they're in my body now. Um, I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive. Um, I also think that performance can, can teach philologists a lot and philologists can teach performance a lot. But at the end of the day, right, uh, language is an embodied thing. It's a cognitive process. It's a sign system. Um, you know, it's a great way to think about um, uh, the spoken word and its impact and its effect. Um, there's a lot more work for philologists to do. Um, there's also a lot of texts that, you know, 50, 60 years ago were regarded as useless, right? That are now being re-looked at and rediscovered. Contracts, shopping lists, you know, papyri that was discarded. That's absolutely fascinating on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, and I also think that in terms of Greek drama, there's an enormous amount to be reinterpreted and thought about. And there's different ways to think about this material. So. Um, the, the, the best philologist in my department, David Sider, right? I'm with him all the time, right? If I can persuade David of an idea, then I, I have something valuable. And David is constantly saying, well, what, have you looked at this? Or what about this? Or what about that? So it's a, a really dynamic process. So I definitely feel like I'm a classicist in that sense. And I actually use some Greek with the vets as well. And, um, you know, sound it out, speak it, have them sing it, uh, work it sometimes. Because it's a beautiful language, right? Thank you. I definitely didn't really think about this before your presentation, but it is, I think, ironic how a lot of times, like, the discussions that we have about war and international politics don't include veterans. How do you think that those discussions change when you include more perspectives from veterans? I think that um, nobody should vote for war until they've spoken to people who've been at war. And we're now thinking about the term veteran as not just people who served in the military, but anybody affected or displaced by war, right? They're veterans too. Family members of veterans suffer war. Spouses, children, right? I mean, it's incredible the stories that you hear. I remember one woman came to a, a program and she said, you know, my husband came back from Vietnam, a completely different man and very violent, and I had to divorce him and get the kids away from him, right? And then as soon as the kids left home, she remarried him. Right? And the kids could not understand what was going on. She said, you just weren't safe. I mean, that's so tragic, right? That she recognized what war had done to this guy. And, and in the early 70s, the, the treatment being offered to Vietnam veterans was, was appalling, right? There was nothing. So I think we have to recognize that it, it, it has a massive impact. Um, the problem is, is that we in a democracy think that somehow it doesn't affect us. In America, 1% of Americans serve in the military which, you know, and many of them join because they want to sit where you're sitting. They want to be college students and get GI Bill money. Many of them are like working class people who just the only way they're going to get to college, right? And then they get caught up in war. And so it's, it's a really difficult thing to uh, talk to your own students about it. But I try and bring vets in all the time to say, look, you vote. This is, this is, this, these are your wars, you voted for them, right? Even if you didn't vote for the person that caused the war, you should be doing something to get them out and to, and to change that. And I think there is a, you know, a troubling tendency of politicians who know nothing about war to just, you know, like we were recently at the brink of war with Iran and to hear people talk about war like it's nothing. Oh, we're going to war, like, oh, it doesn't affect anybody, right? And then suddenly half my vets get called up again, right? 
It's not you getting called up or me, it's them, time and time again, over and over again. And the thing is, if, even if you've served your six years or your eight years, you can be called back at any time. And who does this predominantly affect? It predominantly affects working class Americans, people of color, um, the 40% of combat troops in the United States Marine Corps don't speak English, right? They're Spanish speaking. They're not citizens, right? So this is, this is kind of um, the dirty little secret, right, of American power, right? It's, ex it's exploitative. So we've got to hear from these, these men and women. I think it's important. Um, and uh, this program is not a pro-war or anti-war. We should all be anti-war. I've never met a combat vet who's not completely anti-war. It doesn't mean they're not proud of their service, right? They're very proud of their service, but none, none of them is going to come back and go, yeah, war's great. You should do that again. <coughs> so I think that there are people that we need to hear from, and they need to be part of the public dialogue. And I, you know, I come from a celebrity culture in America with a celebrity president, right? And celebrities go out and do this stuff and talk about veterans, and the veterans hate that. The vet should be the celebrities. They're the people that we should be listening to when we talk about war. And even if we're going to talk about Homer, right? Anybody, any professor could find a local vet and say, come into my class and give us your impressions of this. And um, you get a different perspective, I think. Thank you. Up there. I can speak you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, a very good question. We were talking about this at lunch that, you know, the Iliad is a story of sexual violence and sexual trafficking, right? That's what it is. And we somehow ignore that, right? This old man comes to the camp and he's like, give me back my daughter who you're raping, right? I mean, it's awful, isn't it, right? Um, yeah, you're absolutely right, is this stuff is very, very um, difficult. And I think there's a reason for that. I think in our program, right, when we get around a table, we can talk about what we're going to read and we can contextualize it. Um, yes, I think when we go out to the public, it, it can be very, very difficult to put this material out there. Um, but I also think that the Greek tragedy is very honest about the fact that war crushes women and children and civilians. And uh, I think Aeschylus in particular is constantly asking questions about that to the audience, who are, let's face it, living in a slave society, right? Who are involved in the process of andropodismos. Andropodismos is when you conquer a city, you ransom or kill the men, then you separate the women and children and elderly people, and the women who can be sold into slavery are sold into slavery, probably after they're raped and sexually assaulted, and then the old people and the children are left to die, right? So we know that the Athenians practiced this a couple of times. And so Aeschylus presents a play about that, and it makes you think, well, what, what's his purpose here? Is he trying to say to the audience, think about the ramifications of doing this to people? What I would say is that war still does that. It does that on a much bigger step. When, when a drone is sent in and, and hits a wedding, who do you think is killing, right? So I, I, would, I would say that this material creates honest conversations about the impact of this stuff. But you're absolutely right. It, is, um, it can be blood curdling how difficult it is. Um, so we try and create a place where people can talk about this stuff and feel empowered by it before it goes out to the public. In terms of the public programming, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, people are probably quite surprised sometimes about how um, vicious Greek drama can be. I think they have an idea of it of being elevated and, and lofty. So I don't really have a good answer for how you protect the audience that come and see it. I hope it's we do a program that, can, that we contextualize the material, we treat, it, we treat everybody with respect, and we let everybody talk as they want to talk. But yeah, some people don't want to talk. Some people are going to leave. Some people it is, it, it's going to land really, really hard with. I agree with you. And I think that's one of the the difficulties of this material. Um, I would say 
that Heracles scene, the messenger speech, where he kills his own children. That's a scene I, as it means something to me for one reason, but I've been difficult to do that with the vets. They've wanted to do it because they've wanted to talk about the cost of war on children. And they felt that was really important that, that people heard that. So maybe in America, right, where people kind of sit back and vote for war and death on other people, maybe they should be uncomfortable, right? Maybe they need to kind of understand that there is a cost to what they do. I don't know. That's something I've heard from, from the vets, you know? They're like, if there was a draft, would we be in these wars, you know? Would we have been in Afghanistan and Iraq if, if anybody here could go? But yeah, thank you for that. It's a really good point. I don't have an easy answer for it. It's difficult material, yes. I think with that, we'll, um, we'll wrap it up. Peter, that was an extremely moving and enlightening talk. And I think also it reminds me of the potential for art and life to work together and yet the difficulty of doing that. And so I admire and applaud the work you're doing and also your wonderful talk. So thank you thank very you much. much. Thank you. Thank you.